Coming to the Ambassador Bridge. Bell Isle, I see Bell. Oh crap. Oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. Go up, go up, go up. I'm dead. I'm dead. <laughs> Originally released December 26, 1983 for the Apple II. Developed and published by Sublogic. Here we have the Amiga version of Flight Simulator 2. Over on the PC, it was known as Microsoft's uh, Flight Simulator. And uh, yeah, over there, it was still developed by Sublogic, but uh, Microsoft got their hands on it and uh, published it through themselves. And it is still going on to this very day with a brand new release uh, coming shortly, I believe. The Amiga version came out in November of 1986 and possibly could have come out before that as a launch title from what I've been reading. We'll get more into that later on, but uh, yeah, stick around because this game was worked on at Amiga HQ uh, with the uh, bread binned boxes uh, when it was being created, but it didn't come out at the time. We'll get more into that later on. First, I want to uh, give a little uh, shout out to uh, Von Shemp, aka the uh, Killer Gamer. It was uh, through watching him that I was really inspired to look at this one. I was, I've been wanting to look at this ever since I did my FA-18 review. Now that one was a flight simulator, but it also had arcade elements in it. You don't get much more simulator than flight simulator. Coming to this, especially in these early versions, can be a daunting task. It's uh, 200 pages worth of a flight manual, plus 300 pages on top of that worth of maps. And uh, but it was watching uh, the Killer Gamer uh, do these things. Uh, you know, then I had to I had to read the manual and then check back and see what how he was using it. You know, I owe him a debt of gratitude, and I wanted to let him take over for a second and uh, let you guys check him out. It was a big deal for me. Because I've always wanted to be a pilot. Uh, I could never be a professional pilot. So this is how I lived my dream. It was the flight simulator. Oh, you serious? Come on. Ugh. That doesn't mean that we died. Um, we'll say the landing gear broke. <laughs> Careful now. Careful, careful, careful. No, 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 I hope you'll check out the Killer Gamer. I'm going to leave a links in the annotation card up on the upper right and in the description and comments of the video. Now, I'm well aware that a fully-fledged flight simulator may not be the most entertaining thing to gaze upon, especially if you've never played it before. But I'm going to tell you I've got uh, so many uh, extras uh, to throw in here to keep everything entertaining, hopefully, and uh, historical information, comparisons, uh, reviews from back in the day, the Hall of Fame placements. Uh, this game means something. Don't you have any doubt about it? This was a very um, pivotal title. And uh, people bought it. A lot of people bought these games. That's why they can be still made uh, to this day. How many game series uh, that originated on computers do you see? Uh, originally, the flight, original Flight Simulator on the Apple II came out in 1979. How many games do you know from 1979? Franchises that are still going forward. This game deserves your uh, respect. And uh, I hope uh, you'll uh, watch this and uh, be more knowledgeable on uh, this stuff and how impressive it actually was on uh, your beloved Amiga. Now let's uh, take a look at the box, shall we? Flight Simulator 2 by Bruce Artwick and Chris Green. Put yourself in the pilot seat of a Cessna 182 single engine aircraft and head for the skies. Or fly a Gates Learjet 25G. High speed 3D graphics provide a spectacular panoramic view as you practice takeoffs, landings, and aerobatics. Complete documentation gets you airborne quickly, even if you've never flown before. When you think you're ready, you can test your flying skills with the World War I Ace Aerial Battle Game. Flight Simulator 2 features include 120 airports in five different scenery areas New York, Chicago, Seattle, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Day! Dusk and night flying modes, and a whole awesome. lot more. 
Well, like crashes, a generous sprinkling of crashes, uh, might I uh, add. From the menu, welcome no, to no, Flight Simulator no, no, 2, no, no, Michael Computer Based Flight Simulator. God. This simulator runs on the Amiga computer with single floppy disk drive. It offers aircraft flight simulation that considers 47 important aircraft characteristics and provides multiple window out of the window and control tower views using a 3D flight display. Extensive flight controls acceptable using the mouse or keyboard and a minimum VFR and IFR instrumentation as specified by the FAA are displayed in a movable window. Flight Simulator 2 features detailed graphics that closely simulate a pilot's actual perspective. The 6800 Precision Graphics Driver presents solid modeled images with hidden surface elimination and surface shading with a much greater accuracy than any previous microcomputer flight simulator. The world is more than 10,000 by 10,000 miles square with a resolution of about one hundredth of an inch. Flight Simulator 2 simulates two types of aircraft, a single engine, high performance, propeller driven aircraft of the Cessna 182 class and a business jet of the Gates Learjet 25G class. The Cessna 182 type single engine prop aircraft is an ideal plane for pilot training because it has climb performance and speed that keep a pilot busy, especially on landing approach. The plane is slightly superior to an advanced World War I fighter. This aircraft simulation is designed for realism and presents the feeling of flying this particular aircraft in a real life situation. Flight Simulator 2 will help you learn about flight. It is not, however, a substitute for a flight training course. If you want more information on learning to fly, we recommend that you read the Flight Training Handbook published by the FAA or check with your local airport for information about certified flight training courses. So if you thought landing on an aircraft carrier in F-A-18 was a difficult thing to accomplish, you ain't see nothing compared to landing on a normal airfield in this Cessna in flight simulator 2. Well, Megs isn't exactly the most normal airfield on earth. If you can land a plane at uh, Megs in Chicago, oh no. Oh no. Oh God. you can land it anywhere pretty much. Oh no, it's a man-made dead. island. You can think of it uh, as a stationary aircraft um, carrier. Now, all flight simulator programs into this century, except for one, actually defaulted to Megs Airfield in Chicago because that's where uh, Sublogic was located in the uh, suburbs of Chicago. Excepting, however, the 6800 versions on the Macintosh, the Amiga, and the ST, which actually default to San Francisco. And you know, I think we're going to get some insight into why that is the case a little later on as we dive into no, the history of this program uh, being worked on at uh, Amiga HQ. Before Commodore um, owned them, and uh, we all we know Jay Miner was a big fan. That he wanted a flight simulator on the Amiga. He wanted a computer that would bring you know, Von Sutherland uh, flight simulator, the real deal, into your home. We're going to show off San Francisco a little bit uh, later on, but uh, I wanted to start off at Meg's as a. Uh, well, this is the uh, tradition no, no. for Why these games like until, uh, you know, this century when a Meg's aircraft field was uh, sabotaged by uh, the then uh, mayor of uh, Chicago and, uh, you know, pretty much destroyed right there. And it's uh, sat uh, pretty much dead ever since. I think they're going to make it into a park, I believe. But more importantly, for instructional sakes, I do recommend you start right here at Meg's Airport, because if you can land here, as I said before, you can land anywhere. So take off right here in Chicago, do a loop around, come back, and uh, die many times, I believe, until you finally, finally make that wonderful first landing. It's going to feel so good when you get that uh, first landing, until the panic uh, it comes right back when you realize you're about to go in the water. Let's uh, get into some mix. We're going to start off with info from December of 1985 slash January of 1986. Sublogic stuff. Flight simulator for the Amiga is slated to be released sometime in January. Sublogic is calling it a third generation flight simulator as the 16 bit versions have many impressive improvements over previous releases. Among the changes is an option to fly the standard flight simulator Cessna 182 airplane or 500 mile per hour Learjet. Imagine watching yourself buzz the control tower at 500 miles per hour in a Learjet jet from both the airplanes and towers point of view at the same time. Amiga Flight Simulator should be a spectacular product. 
Some logic has also released 12 scenery discs for Flight Simulator and Jet. These allow you to fly over different geographical areas of the United States. Some logic scenery discs give you a view of the highways, waterways, and other major geographic features of an area, including important landmarks and all major airports. Each disc is $19.95, or you can buy a set of six discs for either the western United States or the eastern portion of the country for $99.95. Now, they were going with what the company told them. They didn't actually release all 12 uh, scenery discs. Well, technically, there might be 12 of them if you include uh, Europe, Japan, and Hawaii in there. Those were separate uh, scenery discs. But they didn't release all of them in the United States, unfortunately. From August slash September of 1986. Now, the last one said it was due in January of uh, 1986. It must have been delayed, because here we are in August, uh, September of 86. And again, this is slated as coming out in November from everything that I could hear. But, but here it is in a listing in August uh, as being out for the Amiga. It says Amiga Game Strategy and Simulation Flight Simulator 2 at $49.95. But uh, listen how they uh, actually describe it. High res, real time color animated flight simulator with practice takeoffs, landings, and aerobatics in your Piper 181 Cherokee Archer. So, that's actually the Piper is what is the aircraft in the Commodore 64 version. So, I, I guess they just. Again, uh, Sublogic must have been promising this thing, but it actually wasn't out at this point. And you can tell because uh, they're describing the Commodore 64 version in the Amiga section. Now, the actual review for the game would end up coming in January, February of 1987, which does support a November of 86 release. Now, there's a cool ad for Microcomputer Services, a Detroit area you know, Amiga place that I remember personally from uh, back in the day. Air traffic control at the Amiga Developers Conference Sublogic was showing three Amigas running Flight Simulator 2 hooked together via the serial port and using the multiple planes option. The screens of each computer showed all three planes in the air. You can hook up any two computers, including Atari STs, IBM PCs, etc., running the latest off-the-shelf version of Flight Simulator 2 and see the other plane out your window. With a special host utility uh, available through Sublogic, you can hook up several. Not sure if the host utility ever got released, but you could hook up you know, any Amiga together via no modem cable or uh, or online with a modem back the very early game to support actual modem play on the Amiga or the ST maybe the Macintosh not DOS despite uh, what it says flight simulator 2 sublogic 713 Edgebrook Drive Champaign Illinois 618 Two zero five out of five stars. This computer gaming legend reaches its finest incarnation, the long-awaited Amiga version. The graphics are superb, as you might expect, with multiple sizable zoom windows for simultaneous views from a variety of perspectives. Fly either a Cessna 182 or a Learjet 25G, fly in real time to a detailed world and buzz familiar landmarks in major cities. Multiplayer features supports flying in shared airspace. Begin your game collection with this one. Be D. Not done with info quite yet from their annual games issue, the top 10 games from November, December of 1989. From the top 10 simulation games under the Amiga at number 5 simulations, recreate a complex or realistic system inside the computer included in this category of sports games, flight simulators, social and political games, and even games that emulate the evolution of cities or whole ecosystems. Depth and detail are what make a simulation game Great. Flight Simulator and Falcon are the best of the Super. Amiga flight simulators. And finally, for info in the individual editors, top tens. Ben here. I think Ben is the one who did the review. BD. BD might stand for Ben, his first initial there. And Flight Simulator 2 comes in at his third favorite overall I game. I've played literally I thousands of games, aircraft. but when I really want to play, nothing satisfies like a good simulation, whether it's buzzing the Golden Gate Bridge with Flight Simulator 2. Building a fantastic layout and pinball construction set or trying to shade the dealer in Craps Academy. How can anything compare with the sheer wonder of a five-star simulation? So back to some actual gameplay. Now you are seeing me learn this game through this video. I start out dying, trying to land at Meg's, crashing over and over. And I've got Meg's so down, good. but now I'm having trouble at the Chicago O'Hare, a massive airport with a pretty long runway. And I just, I'm having so many issues and I'm going to uh, 
impart upon you uh, the knowledge I've collected, and I haven't even figured it out at this point yet, but uh, eventually you will have seen me figure out this game by the end. Um, the thing about this game is I'm using my joystick, and uh, you can't just use your joystick, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, this is a digital uh, joystick, and this thing does not self-center. That is the main problem. The stalling you saw so much of... This is not popping the clutch or something in an automobile. The engine is not stalling. Now, stalling in an aircraft is when the wind speed around it can no longer support the airplane gliding. So it essentially becomes a ton of bricks. And it, gravity gives way. Now look to the gauges on the bottom next to your current climb or descend the up and down gauge there. To the direct left of that is your aileron gauge, your elevator gauge, and your rudder gauge. And the one in the middle between the aileron and the rudder is your elevator. And when it gets to the top there, like you see, it's not completely at the top. I think my actual my airspeed is what caused that particular stall. If it goes below 40, you're going to stall. If, you're, if your elevator gets to that high point, it's going to stall. And the problem with this particular version of Flight Simulator is that you don't have a self-centering joystick. Uh, so you go up or down, you know, normally speaking, a actual, you know, flight stick kind of joystick, you let go of it, it automatically centers itself. To the left and the right and up and the down. And see, I'm just going left, I'm going, you know, I, I can't, I, I don't understand. How do I center this thing? Um, just because it's a digital joystick doesn't necessarily mean it, you know, it's not self-centering. FA-18 self-centers, it can be done, you can program that. This game does not. So I believe that 95% of the time when you stall, it is because your elevator is too high. You just naturally want to pull down on the joystick, you want to fly the machine with your joystick, and you pull up pull up on it and well you keep pulling up it's going to stall guaranteed doesn't matter how fast you're going doesn't matter how many flaps you have you, you put it to that top position you will stall no matter what this would not be a problem with a normal flight stick kind of a joystick which this game actually does support i think uh, again i don't i've never um hooked up an analog stick to the amiga but this game is one of the few amiga games that does support an analog joystick so that is a plus if you have an analog joystick for the Amiga still just because it's a digital joystick they should have programmed it to self-center so I had to uh, fly with both the joystick and the keyboard so I do my uh, rotations with the left and the right and the up and down with the joystick but I always have my right hand on the number five key on the number pad because number five centers everything <laughs> Not, not the elevator. I have to keep, keep an eye on the elevator, but number five will uh, center the rudder so, I don't, so you're not completely going left and right out of control all the time. So five centers it, and uh, with, with it in mind that you go all the way to the top there and you will stall no matter what. You know, the key to this game is you got to go down to go up. If you hit, if you get a stall, remember, you have to go down to go up. So immediately press down on the joystick. And once you get that stall and then hit the throttle to increase your speed. And that should pull you out of it. I wish I would have figured that out a little sooner. And I hope you enjoyed my little compilation of crashes there that I just showed you. Now the key to enjoying this game is treating it seriously. No, this is not about going around shooting a bunch of people. It's not about all the eye candy and polygons, you know. There's not all that much uh, scenery in this one. I mean, there's, it's, it's there, but, uh, you know, it's it's spread out. And there is a, a World War I uh, fighting mode that I will uh, show you just to uh, get a look at it. And while several magazines praise the World War I ace mode, you're not really going to get that uh, from me. I mean, it was impressive to them at the time because nobody had... Because of the overall, you know, simulation of the airplane flying you know, combined with the, uh, you know, shooting of the planes at the time because nobody had done that before. A lot of magazines thought it was impressive. However, there were no shortage of far better World War One uh, 
Combat uh, Simulations, Knights of the Sky, Red Baron, just to name a couple. And they're, they've if Flight Simulator 2, you can't get much more simulation than Flight Simulator 2. Well, you can't get much more arcade than its uh, built-in World War One mode. You know, no arcade person is going to be happy with the World War One mode. Uh, don't even bother with it. No. Treat this game seriously. There is nothing like uh, navigating through your navigational aids in the middle of the night when there is nothing to be seen. No grass. No water. It's as black as can be and you know you insert your course and you find it in the dead of night and you know that you're gonna find it that is a kind of fun that is so hard to explain and while I've long said that the uh, best Simulations involve a combination of uh, simulation and arcade. And I think the silent majority of gamers, that's, that's what they like. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's either 100% arcade usually or 100% simulation. And uh, the, those in the middle type of games don't get the respect uh, they deserve. However, there is a fun that is unmatched when you have that feeling of, you know, maybe I could do this in real life. And you can only get that from the most simulation of the uh, simulations. Let's uh, talk about our gauges. Navigation radios. These are used to tune in and identify. Vor radio aids to be covered later. These are 200 channel radios that receive frequencies between 108.00 and 117.95 megahertz with 50 kilohertz separation. These receivers control the omni bearing indicators. The Nav 1 radio controls the top omni bearing indicator, and the Nav 2 radio controls the bottom omni bearing indicator. DME radio. This is tuned to the Nav 1's VOR station. Its digits tell you how many nautical miles from the VOR station you are. ADF, Automatic Direction Finder. Used to tune non directional radio beacons, NDBs. When the ADF option is selected, the bearing indicator takes the place of VOR 2, and the ADF receiver replaces the NAV 2 radio. The ADF receiver covers frequencies from 200 kHz to 1,699 kHz in 1 kHz increments. Now, in the video, I'm about to switch on the ADF, so let's uh, talk a little bit more about that. The automatic direction finder is used with non directional radio beacons. When the ADF receiver is tuned to an NDB, the needle on the bearing indicator points to the station and shows the bearing relative to the nose of the aircraft. The magnetic bearing to the station can be calculated by adding the relative bearing to the aircraft's magnetic heading. Tracking and homing techniques can be used to fly to an NBD, but strong crosswinds require special procedures to avoid spiraling toward or away from it. And the manual gives this example of it. Taunton at uh, 227 in the ADF. Tune that in and uh, your needle, you know, just point it towards zero. You know, that's all you gotta do. Turn until it points to zero and you're headed towards that particular station. Not necessarily an airport, although it could be at an airport, but you know, it'll head you straight towards that beacon. It couldn't be simpler uh, to use. Now here is the full map of the uh, Chicago area. Tons and tons of uh, navigational aids in there. Tons of airports. A few ADFs, not all that many, but they are out there. And zooming in, here is a look at our current flight. We're taking off from Lawrence J. Timmerman. We've tuned in our ADF to Sheboygan at 254. And we're just centering. We're heading to zero. We're set, move it until it hits zero, and you know you're going to get uh, to that uh, station, that ADF station. At the same time, we've also tuned in our NAV-1 to the Oshkosh VOR at 111. Point eight. Now, above the ADF gauge, as we uh, center ourselves to zero, is the um, NAV-1 radio. Now, there's a couple ways you can deal with this. You can press the arrow located to the bottom left of that gauge and just keep pressing it until it centers itself. And at that point, it, that will tell you the actual course you need to lay out on your compass. So, you know, whatever that says when it's centered, that's where you need to go to head directly to it. It's, you know, fairly easy once uh, you, uh, you know, consider how to use it. Um, or you can um, do it in a more complicated fashion, which I'm doing here. I already set it to the heading of 305. So this means I've already taken a look at the map and I've decided that I want to take a heading of 305 
at some point, but not quite immediately. So I'm waiting for the needle on nav one gauge to center itself. And once it does, that's when you take your turn and head towards 305. That way, you know, in case you want to line up with a particular runway in a certain area, this is you know, how you plan your course accordingly. And perhaps a better example of this is going to be in my next flight, so keep an eye out there when I head from Whitman Field, and I again use the Sheboygan ADF, but then I keep going from Sheboygan, and I um, use the Lawrence J. Timmerman uh, VOR at 112.5, and I wait until the needle centers itself, and I've already tuned in a 90 degree course, and when that needle centers itself, that means I can head towards um, the other side of Lake Michigan into Michigan into Grand Rapids area. So, you know, I could have just gone to Lawrence J. Timmerman, but, you know, I wanted to take a look at the uh, Oshkosh uh, area there at Whitman Field and take a look around. And uh, by using the Sheboygan ADF and just keep keep going in a straight line and waiting for Lawrence J. Timmerman, the nav, to uh, center itself and then to turn... That's a shortcut, in essence. Now, we've currently tuned in our NAV-1 to the ILS frequency at this airport. Not too many of those in this game, but uh, you know, they're scattered about. And, and it uh, gives you a glide scope and to uh, get you down. I'm not using it correctly yet here. I'm thinking it's this airport. <laughs> That's the wrong airport. I'm like, why is this keep going off the needle. I don't know. It's because, well, it's not the right airport yet. Look at the DME. You know, I'm 12 miles away from the thing at the point. But, yes, ADF, I actually really like the ADF. There, I wish there were more of them because for somebody just coming to this program, that's the easiest way to get uh, where you're going is by using the ADF. Tuning into a station on the ADF and just, you know, making that needle hit zero and then you know you're going there now. You know, the actual navvores are far more powerful, but, you know, they take some getting used to. And, you know, some explaining and reading about how to use them uh, correctly, but the ADF, it's very simple. I wish there were some more for the people, you know, who don't know what they're doing quite yet. Back to some historical insights from May slash June of 1987, Amiga World. There's nothing junior about the Amiga 500, Commodore's new computer for home users. Announcing the first great Amiga get-together, Amiga World Expo, September 11th and 13th, San Francisco. The review, in its various incarnations through the year, Sublogix Flight Simulator 2 has become somewhat of a legend. While the program considers over 45 different aircraft programmers to make the simulation as close to the real world as possible, it is the graphics that give the essence of realism. Studying the program apart on the Yumiga Mountains, buildings and bridges are made from solid-shaped 3D shapes. There are cities, runways, rivers, oceans, islands, and clouds, all defined with mathematical accuracy, so they can be redrawn at any angle or distance. The screen is updated at 10 frames per second, the fastest sublogic simulation ever. Perspective people. Now, while I am uh, speeding this up a lot, it's not because I think it runs slow. It's just because I feel the best way to present this program is by showing you as much as possible. That you, you see all the wonderful things this game has to offer, and I actually think it's faster than 10 frames per second. I believe the actual creator of the program said that the original IBM XT uh, version, the Microsoft the Flight Simulator 2, ran at 2 frames per second. This one ran at like 15 frames per second, he said. And don't you forget that this was fast in its heyday. I'm showing you the IBM version at the moment so you see just how much more impressive the Amiga version is compared to that. Now, the IBM version is going faster uh, by default than the Amiga version. That's because it actually has a built-in frame limiter. Very strange for such an early program. It's a PC booter, too. It's not DOS. I had to run that sucker off the floppy disk, and it was very hard to get running on my actual hardware, but, but my DOS hardware is very fast. An actual XT machine would have been running that thing in, in a slideshow, and uh, very fast on the Amiga. You know, keep that perspective. These fantastic uh, aerial views, spot plane, yeah, the uh, IBM version doesn't have that. CGA for color uh, glory there. Now it actually is capable of a composite. Nobody used composite back in the day, but uh, yeah, that 
most people. We're looking at it like this or in black and white. Back to the review, while the Learjet is not quite as accurate a simulation as the Cessna, for me, a non-pilot, it is a lot more fun to fly at Mach 0.8 than the relatively low speeds of the single-engine prop plane. In the World War I ace mode, you play Snoopy to the Computer 6 Red Baron shooting down many enemy craft while bombing the fuel depots and factories. When you're not busy terrorizing the Germans, there are plenty of sights to see with over 120 airports and four major metropolitan areas. You can buzz New York Harbor and the Statue of Liberty, Boston, or the Marina del Rey area of LA, or like those 23rd century members of the Federation, you can fly under the Golden Gate Bridge and around the Oakland San Francisco Bay Area. You can't actually fly under the Golden Gate Bridge. The uh, actual road part is literally on top of the water. If you've seen Flight Simulator on other machines, get ready for some spectacular improvements. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've always wanted to fly through the hangar at full speed. Upside down. Forty-nine ninety-five. From November of 1988, Amiga World's all-time top 40 Amiga games. Coming in as the 23rd best Amiga game of all time, one of the golden oldies. Flight Simulator 2 is greatly improved by the Amiga's graphics and sound. The additional high-density scenery disc, $24.95 each, lets you fly in and out of most of the country's major airports, as well as hundreds of smaller ones. So here we're approaching Grand Rapids, Michigan, and we are tuned in to the airport's ILS uh, frequency, which gives us a glide scope. Now you see the needle on the right there is slowly coming to center. That means if it's on the right, it means turn to the right to center it. If it's on the left, that means go to the left. And you want it uh, centered, you want both the um, vertical and horizontal needle centered. And the goal is to uh, gradually fall to the ground this way. And um, theoretically, you could land the plane using the ILS system you know, with no visibility. Not necessarily in this game, because some airports aren't... Um, programmed correctly. Here I should be on the right runway. I don't know that yet. I didn't uh, you know, do my research uh, ahead of time. I'm just following you know, the scope and it's, it's taking me forever for it to actually get me on that runway. I don't know if maybe this is the way it is. I doubt it, but <laughs> again, right now I'm centered, but it's telling me to go to the left now. See, it's not programmed right for all of the airports. But uh, usually the ILS systems in this game will get you lined up at some point so you can use it you know, to properly line yourself up with. You'll probably, you might have to break uh, from what it says at some point and do it yourself, but uh, it will line you up at some point and then you can, uh, you know, you're descending at an acceptable rate and you can land nice and smoothly like uh, right there. Now, notice here that the color of the sky has changed. I think this is actually the best look for this game. I've added fog to it. You can add fog, uh, which gives you this color effect. You can add clouds, which is more gray looking. You can even add wind, and you're going to see as I uh, take off, and it's going all crazy here. It's uh, uh, very, uh, very uh, unpredictable. I gave it a little bit uh, too much uh, wind there. <laughs> but uh, you can add all these things. It's not random, though. You have to input it all yourself. I'm not a fan of that. I just don't. Uh, I, I don't have the patience to sit there and input a bunch of uh, you know, directions and uh, speeds. That's uh, not for me. I'd rather just roll the dice and uh, get uh, some different weather. Now, I'm currently heading away from Grand Rapids. Uh, towards the end of Scenery Disc 9, I'm inserting a new Scenery Disc, Scenery Disc 11, the Detroit area scenery. Now notice the change in graphics. Notice that there are now fields, so the graphics have improved to some degree here. Uh, technically, Scenery Disc 11 came out before Scenery Disc 9, but uh, it seems like the different Scenery Discs focused on different uh, things. So Scenery Disc 9, the Chicago disc, uh, seemed to focus on the airports themselves. There were tons of taxiways and stuff on in the different airports in Scenery Disc 9. There are no taxiways on any of the airports in uh, Scenery Disc 11, but you have just the overall graphics because of those different kind of fields there. That is nicely improved upon, and they got rid of that in the next Scenery Disc. And the roads are incredible in Scenery Disc 11. Just tons. Not just interstates, but uh, they got actually Detroit especially, and any of the major cities in this one. It's, it's, Regular roads, you know, 
is the interstates, the uh, U.S. routes, the state highways, the normal, regular roads. I know them well in, the, in Detroit, anyway, and it's incredible how many roads they have in this disc. So it seems like different uh, scenery discs uh, focused in different areas. Computer Gaming World, April of 1987. You come a long way, baby. The history of an epic program by Daniel Hockman. Much like uh, Amiga World's review for Word Perfect, Computer Gaming World um, went st- st- that was a good landing. way out of place biblical in this uh, thing, but uh, I guess we'll have to uh, go uh, through this cringe here. Computer games tend to be the offspring of the hardware in which they exist. As hardware became more powerful, programmers developed new techniques to make use of that power in games, thereby improved. Games that were hot five years ago look like dinosaurs now, but not so with Flight Simulator. As the technology improved, Flight Simulator improved with it. Very few programs are strong enough to warrant the continued release of new and improved versions. This, then, is a brief history of the ongoing development of this epic program that every computer gamer should own. In the beginning, there was Bruce Artwick and Stu Moment. Behold, they were roommates at the University of Illinois. Let there be 16-bit. And Bruce saw the new 16-bit IBM PC, and he said, It is good. (laughs) This is horrible. So when Microsoft approached Artwick about an IBM version of Flight Simulator, a deal was struck. Microsoft was looking for a translation of Flight Simulator. But Bruce felt that the new 16-bit machine offered the chance to develop a new program altogether. A new heaven and a new earth. Awe inspired. This is the only way to describe what Artwork did with the 6800 versions of Flight Simulator 2. When I first sat down at the monitor of my Amiga and began flying around the Bay Area, I was astonished at what the program had become. But first, the story of the development of the Amiga and Macintosh versions. When Amiga Corp was developing what would become the Amiga 1000, they approached Artwork and asked him to do some 3D graphics work and develop an Amiga version of Flight Simulator 2. An agreement was reached, and Bruce spent New Year's Eve 1984-1985 holed up in a hotel suite with other Amiga developers working feverishly at the keyboard of a gray box Amiga. When Commodore bought Amiga artwork and Commodore entered into talks concerning the Amiga version of Flight Simulator 2, but unlike the talks with Amiga, things did not work out June 1985. When the contract on the Amiga version of Flight Simulator 2 fell through, Artwick developed his efforts to the Mac. Following the March 1986 release of the Mac version, Sublogic returned to the Amiga version and also began developing the Atari ST version. The Amiga and ST versions shipped in November 1986. Sublogic's Flight Simulator has come a long way. From that marathon flying session in 1979 to the present, it has never failed to hold my interest. But then, that is how an epic should be, right? If you were any good at writing epics... You wouldn't be a magazine reviewer. Flight Simulator 2 making the reader's top choices, I believe, at number 29, with a score of a 7.05. As I land at this airport with my uh, fuel gauges uh, yeah, definitely running on fumes here, you might ask yourself, can I actually run out of fuel in this game? Well, yes, you can. And uh, right after I uh, land, uh, barely surviving there, and fuel up, you're going to see me uh, here. Um, the up. results of uh, running out of fuel when I reloaded. Just, uh, yeah, just so you can see, and uh, after getting myself in quite a horrible stall, I managed to uh, free myself and land in a field, and it's still kind of, uh, you know, push itself along. Maybe if I waited, you know, a year, I could actually push myself to an airport there. From July of 88, Sublogic is excited about their cooperative effort with Microsoft on Flight Simulator 3. Flight Simulator 3 offers a significant graphic leap forward on the IBM, and there were times I thought I was looking at an Amiga or ST screen. And yes, when they said the Amiga was third generation Flight Simulator, they were not lying. It should have been called Flight Simulator 3, because look at Flight Simulator 3 for the IBM PC. Look familiar at all? It is a direct port of the Amiga version of Flight Simulator 2. So, yeah, uh, and in order to get it to look, it actually is a very early game to support VGA graphics. I'm using a 640 by like 350 
uh, resolution at 16 colors, I believe. At, it supports 256 color VGA at 320 by 200, but it's very blocky. Landed. Uh, it doesn't, compared to the Amiga version, it doesn't look as good as the Amiga version. It has to have this medium sort of resolution. I don't think the Amiga version is running at uh, medium res, which is uh, 640 by uh, 200 on the Amiga. I don't think it is. I think it's 320 by uh, 200. But uh, the IBM actually has to run in this uh, 640 by uh, 300 or 350 in order to look comparable uh, to the Amiga. So, yeah. yeah. But it does uh, support my uh, analog uh, flight stick, and it supports rudder and throttle. Again, there are mid-90s games which don't support rudder and throttle, so it does have uh, that going for it. From November of 1996, the 150 best games of all time. Coming in at number 79, from the Atari 800 to the Amiga, this civilian flying simulator brought virtual flight to the masses. And it even features an individual editor, uh, Denny's uh, Best Flight Simulators of All Time, at uh, number 7. Let's uh, keep things rolling with Antic, the Atari resource, January of 1987. Oh, we don't get much of a chance to show off uh, Atari magazines, do we? Your Reos has arrived. You want to be any more like a Commodore there, guys? SD Flight Simulator 2, the mouse that soared. Unlikely as it sounds, the most exciting SD software so far this year is a mouse-controlled flight simulator that offers more features than many professional pilot training units. Flying an airplane with a mouse and a keyboard is a clumsy ordeal. It feels as if you're trying to fly an airplane with one hand tied behind your back. There's too much work for a sliding and clicking mouse to handle. Nevertheless, it only takes about a two or three days to get used to the mouse controls. The early Link trainers had no scenery at all. Subsequent simulators featured generic scenery. Nondescript rivers, roads, runways, and oceans. Such scenery made traffic patterns and local flights easier, but cross-country flights quickly became boring and predictable because there were only one or two possible runway or scenery configurations. By contrast, once you see the surprising amount of detail present in SD Flight Simulator 2 scenery, you'll want to switch on the autopilot and spend several hours sightseeing. And when the ST market crumbled in America, Antic abandoned Atari and came over to the Amiga. Amiga Plus, uh, December 1990. Amiga Classics. In the past five years, a lot of Amiga hardware and software has come and gone. Some of it was great and some of it stank. Some products were so far ahead of their nearest competitors that other developers just stopped trying to compete. As far as simulators go, there are a number of uh, titles, each with their own merits. Silent Service, F-19 Stealth Fighter, and Gunship from Micropose, Flight Simulator 2, and Jet from Sublogic and Falcon from Spectrum Hollywood are considered among the best in flight and uh, underwater simulations. So Antic was really touting those uh, mouse controls uh, for some reason. Yeah, I uh, played with the mouse controls at the beginning for a tiny little... Bit. Uh, mouse doesn't uh, self-center either. Even though the mouse is analog, yeah, that doesn't that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't self-center. It's awful with the mouse. No, I recommend a joystick combined, you know, with your uh, hand on the keyboard, and that I feel is the best. Unless you have an actual analog uh, self-centering joystick. Now, if you look at the ST version, you might be tempted to say because they look virtually identical you might be tempted to say oh st port st port and they came out you know the same month but you would be wrong because no this game was worked on at amiga headquarters this could have been a launch title but commodore and in their infinite wisdom decided just to buy amiga and uh, kick uh, sublogic to the curb this to have this on day one in 1985 launching with the Amiga, that could have been a game changer. Might have really uh, rocketed the Amiga upward. You never know. Now we just passed Niagara Falls. You might have noticed some elevation changes there. This game does keep track of elevations. I'm not sure how wonderful it is. You know, I think individual cities. You know, it knows the airport. It knows the city elevation. It knew Niagara Falls there because that's a special attraction for the scenery disc. But a lot of it is flat, but it does, you know, keep track of it to some degree. It also knows when you enter the water when you're near an airport. It seems to have uh, signaled off, you know, but at max if you go into the water, it's going to say splash. But uh, if you go way off, uh, it doesn't know. Some buildings and scenery are considered solid objects. You know, if you hit them, you will crash. Others, uh, you can go right through them. We had some fun in uh, Tiger Stadium in Detroit. 
lets us switch over to compute January of 1986 before the Amiga and ST versions were released. The software bestsellers based on actual Billboard charts. The first time I'm showing anything from Billboard in my uh, reviews. Number two under Entertainment Flight Simulator 2 Sublogic Aircraft Simulation. From January of 89, the best home computer products. These days you can run a train, command a moon mission, captain a submarine, and drive a race car all from your computer, but in the early 1980s, one software package reigned supreme in the world of personal computer simulations, Flight Simulator. Despite the competition, or perhaps because of it, Flight Simulator continues to excite the imagination and retain its standing as the benchmark of computer simulation programs. The program has even spawned anon scenery discs. Flight Simulator garners the Compute Choice Award for simulation software not only because of its depth of design, but also because of its breadth of scope. It operates on almost every personal computer, including the IBM PC and Compatibles, Macintosh, Apple II, Atari ST and Apic computers, Amiga, and Commodore 64 128. And the importance of a game this complex coming out on your system, you know, it meant something. It's like Word Perfect coming out on the Amiga. They treated that uh, as quite a big deal and this could have been a launch title on the IBM you know in order for the PC compatibles to be considered compatible with the IBM you had to run Lotus and you had to run flight simulator 2 then you then you were considered a PC compatible we should definitely talk about the uh, Learjet a little bit now I uh, fooled around with it a little bit on my uh, journey and fooled around with it is the operative uh, term I bet a lot of people back in the day you know, this is their primary method of playing this game, was to uh, grab the Learjet and go 500 uh, knots. And, uh, you know, it's fun and it's uh, kind of exhilarating. And uh, the whole game actually feels faster because of the actual playing. And still, for me, it was only fun for a little while. It was fun going from Detroit to Chicago in 30 minutes, much like it would uh, in real life. But, you know, the, the instruments are the same. You know, the simulation of the Learjet is it's not, it's not really a simulation. Uh, the Cessna is what it's all about. And I think you're doing yourself a disservice if you're just uh, flying around in the Learjet. The fun is in the Cessna. Yeah, it might be a little slower, but that's where the realism lies, and that's what this game is about. You know, treating it seriously. From Ahoy, January of 88. Tops in Amiga Entertainment, Flight Simulator is a classic computer simulator that has never looked or played better. The scenery, in particular, benefits greatly from the Amiga's astounding graphics. Designer Bruce Artwick's Flight Simulator is deservedly one of the best-selling games of all time. Ahoy's Amiga user, May of 88. The program which made simulators a hot category, Flight Simulator 2, is at its best on the Amiga. The Amiga's visual capabilities breathe new life into the scenery. Designer Boot Artwork's Flight Simulator has sold over 1 million discs, counting all editions. Take a test flight and find out why so many other computer owners wouldn't be without Flight Simulator 2. Commodore Magazine, December of 88, showing off the best of 1988. Under head-to-head -head games, what gives this tried-and-true flight simulator such appeal is that you can fly wing-to-wing -wing with another player via modem. Everyone knows how good sublogic flight simulators are, but with this one, you can show other players your stunts while he witnesses yours. Here's a new magazine for our arsenal, The Guide to Computer Living, featuring Timothy Leary as an editor, December of 1986. The best and not-so-best awards. The not-so-best or more humor-based, the longest program loading time, anything by Electronic Arts. We wanted to identify the specific EA program that took the longest, but we can't be conclusive. We're still waiting for them to load. In a similar vein, the most time-consuming computer task, Flight Simulator. At first, we thought the longest thing you could do with a microcomputer was compile C code with the Amiga Metacom code compiler. But then we discovered the New York to Los Angeles flight in Sublogic's Flight Simulator, taking place in real time. That's a six, seven hour trip. Six or seven hours of staring at computerized dials, needles, and gauges. Does that sound like a good time or what? Humor gives way to props. Sublogic's Flight Simulator is not a game. It's nearly an FCC accreditation. If you always thought you were going to learn to fly one day, this complicated and fun program will get you started. There are lots of scenery discs, so you can practice flying around lots of U.S. cities and a few foreign countries, landing and taking off from their airports. Now let's inject some uh, British perspective into all this. Commodore Computing International, November 1988. Sublogic is the name behind a single program's 250 weeks in the U.S. charge. CCI takes a look behind the legend. Stu Moment, uh, chairman of uh, Sublogic right there. There are 16,000 airports in the U.S., says Stu Moment. 9,000 of them private. 
you get the feeling that he is prepared to visit all of them if it is necessary to ensure the future flight simulators have covered the ground with sufficient accuracy. And there's a Bruce Artwick uh, president and uh, creator of the program. From computer and video games, June of 87, once in the blue moon, a product emerges that goes on and on, selling as if it had been launched only last week. Sublogic's Fight Simulator 2 is one such program, originally released for the IBM and then the Apple II way back in 1983-84. Flight Simulator 2 has sold by the hundreds of thousands to businessmen, pilots, and uh, gamesters alike. Flight Simulator 2 is easily the most authentic program of its type to have been released for a home micro. The 3D graphics are stunning and the whole package has been religiously documented by people who obviously love flying. FS2 defies superlatives and must be seen to be experienced. From ST Action, July of 88. Short of devoting the entire magazine to this aircraft simulation, it would be impossible to cover every aspect in detail. Suffice to say, Flight Simulator 2 is the most thorough simulation in this uh, super test. We have looked at a variety of titles with varying degrees of realism, but Flight Simulator 2 is, without doubt, the most complete. An indication of this uh, thoroughness is indicated by the accompanying 140-page flight manual. Mouse controls are an excellent substitute for the control yoke, and the instrumentation reacts realistically to your directions. Simply the most recommendable simulation available on the ST. And finally, in the uh, only Amiga-specific uh, mention of Flight Simulator 2 from a British perspective that I could find, again, they were really more into the ST originally, is this Amiga Format uh, Special Edition. And unfortunately, or perhaps a testament to the game, it is the only uh, mention of it in a negative uh, light. These days, practically every popular aeroplane has been analyzed, simplified, and converted into a silicone representation which anyone with an Amiga and 40 quid to spare can take up into the air. The Amiga flight simulator scene was born in the States in 1988. Wrong year. It will be born in 86 with the release of Flight Simulator 2. This isn't a terribly exciting excursion into the atmosphere as it tries to faithfully recreate a Learjet, a Cessna, and a biplane. Even in 1988, it looked decidedly 8-bit, was overly technical, and only appealed to people with deep pockets. It cost 50 pounds! Oh, cry me a river. You know, it's a game that's not going to appeal to everybody. Duh. But don't be an idiot. Don't say it looks 8-bit. You don't know anything about the systems if you say this looks 8-bit. And in Europe, unfortunately, price was like 70% of their rating system. If it was too high priced, that was enough to make call it a horrible game. Unbelievable. Buy it if you can afford it, or don't buy it if you can't. You know, and you know a lot of people in Europe were going to pirate it anyway. It, it makes no sense to criticize the price like that. And despite the high price, apparently people bought it because it was mentioned in billboard charts, you know, how many 120 something weeks in the US charts there only appeals to those with deep it's my uh, butt. Welcome to my home city, everybody. Detroit. You can actually fly under the Ambassador Bridge, which connects uh, Detroit with uh, Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Unlike the uh, Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, which you can't fly under in this game. But you can do it uh, over here in Detroit and fly over Tiger Stadium. Of all the things in the world, I never would have thought they uh, would uh, do Tiger Stadium. Look at the roads there. That I know that by heart. The, that every All those roads go into a Campus Marshes Park right there. The uh, Renaissance Center series of uh, skyscrapers there. The tallest uh, building, the Central Tower, the tallest building in Michigan. Uh, Belle Isle Park was an island uh, we flew over. My favorite place in the world, connecting the Detroit River with Lake St. Clair. We flew over every single great lake in this adventure of ours. And uh, see that the green area? That's actually where the city of Detroit completely surrounds Highland Park and uh, Hamtramck. So, yes, this game was incredibly impressive back in the day. Why, why would you want to play it today? Well, it's on the Amiga number one. And Claim you love the Amiga, and why not play some impressive stuff for the system that you love, number one. Number two is, you know what? Newer is not always better. Look at that draw distance. You can see Lake St. Clair to the left there, going through the Detroit River to Lake Erie. You can see the southern as the southern tip of Ontario. Turn around there. Like, that is incredible draw distance on the Amiga, and you can't, yeah, you think the 90s Sims had that? No, 
<laughs> they would put the worst quality, super zoomed in, satellite imaged bitmaps onto the land, and you had to be 30,000 feet in the air for it to even make any kind of sense. They lost the roads. You know, no. The, newer is not always better, and they would start focusing on the, uh, you know, the passenger jets and going from New York to London, you know, way, you know, large distances instead of these, you know, civilian, normal consumer uh, planes here. <laughs> it's all GPS now, so just let the thing fly itself and land itself on autopilot, you know. This offers you something perhaps the newer ones can't give you. I'm not saying the newer ones aren't necessarily better eventually, but there were some not so wasn't so clear-cut every single new one was obviously better I disagree with that there is value in coming back and seeing the history and seeing how impressive it all, all was uh, back in the day I hope you all enjoyed this quite broad look at Flight Simulator 2 on the Amiga you know, it's a game I highly recommend especially with those scenery discs get a hold of those uh, several uh, scenery discs uh, very detailed around the country and in Europe, Japan, Hawaii. You know, it's a lot of fun. I haven't even covered any. You know, there's so much stuff I haven't even gotten to. There's so much more that I can personally look forward to looking at. I hope you will check out The Killer and Gamer. Hope you'll check out my review for FA 18 Interceptor, Wing Commander 2, and how about The Duel Test Drive 2? See you all later. Check out my written review if you haven't, and uh, yeah, goodbye.